Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the next speaker is a man who needs no introduction at all. He is uh, the creator of Monix, um, one of the contributors to justly renowned Cuts Effect. Uh, and even if you only count these two of his accomplishments, you could probably build dozens of successful projects, and make a whole career using the code he wrote. Also known for his um, disputatious style and thought-provoking writing, which are the hallmarks of an excellent speaker. On a personal note, he is also closer to my heart because uh, he mentions that he is a Haskell enthusiast. I bet you can't wait for uh, to hear the talk. So, without further overdue, Alexandru Nedelku. Alexandru, the stage is yours. <laughs> Hey guys, I'm happy to be here and to give you this presentation. Um, it's been more than a year since I've participated in a conference and um, I'm really excited about it. <laughs> so uh, without uh, further ado, um, this is what we are going to talk about today. So Scala is um, um, not a very opinionated language, and it's a really expressive language allowing us to express the abstractions that we need in our code. Uh, but we sometimes have uh, overlapping um, uh, solutions to problems. It's definitely not a, uh, there's only one way to do it language, and uh, that's fine. I love it for it. Uh, but uh, sometimes for beginners, it can be um, difficult to make choices about which solutions to pick uh, for problems. And to, one topic that often comes up is uh, what to pick for uh, expressing abstractions, uh, a classic OOP-based design or um, ad hoc polymorphism via type process. Uh, and we are going to talk about this choice for today. And uh, as an agenda, and I have a lot of material to cover uh, on some of the slides, I'm going to go a little too fast. So in case I um, end up um, without uh, enough time, please see me afterwards in the Q&A session. Uh, we are going to talk about abstraction, what is OOP, what, is, what are type classes, the ideological clash between them, uh, and conversions, how to convert from a classic OOP design to type classes and vice versa. And uh, some recipes and best practices, um, not as many as I'd like to cover. Uh, hopefully we'll uh, continue doing that uh, um, elsewhere. So abstraction, and it's important to talk about it. Uh, thinking about uh, things like object types, we can find common traits between them um, that um, um, common traits that we like to focus on, for example, that solve our, solve our problems. If we look, for example, at these types in the Scala, uh, in Scala standard library, the top types are uh, collections. Um, three of these types uh, can be uh, iterated over and uh, have an insertion order. Sorted set doesn't have an insertion order. It's sorted. Um, you know, this can be concatenated, but only sorted set has a concatenation that um, is commutative. A string also can be concatenated and is not commutative, it's just associative. Long has a commutative uh, plus. Um, this these uh, types at the bottom have what is called an error context on which with which you can handle errors. Option can also be uh, used to signal errors that you don't care about, but isn't exactly like this. Um, all of this can be iterated over. Uh, array and vector can be indexed efficiently. Um, sorted set actually can be indexed fairly efficiently, but list cannot be. So as you can see, we can find common traits and similarities between them. We can group them and that's the important part. And we can maybe focus just on those um, attributes that we care about for solve solving a certain problem. So abstraction, let's try to give a definition like in all good presentations. So to draw away, withdraw, remove, and this would be like the Latin origin, I think. To consider it as a general object or idea without regard to matter. A member of an idealized subgroup and contemplate it according to the abstracted quality which defines the subgroup. Or in the case of software development, we basically speak about idealized 
idealization. I'm probably butchering the English language right now, sorry. Um, which means removing details that aren't relevant, um, you know, out of sight, out of mind. We only focus on what's important and generalization, which means um, grouping um, object types in subgroups such that we can transfer knowledge, recipes, proofs. And this really translates into um, code reuse and correctness, which we'll talk about. And you know we want to um, uh, we want abstraction in our language and in our programs because uh, managing complexity is like a juggling act. There is only so much we can keep in our heads, and removing details we don't care about is one way of managing abstraction. Code reuse is another, and so on. Uh, and our software projects only become more complex. And one important notion that we should talk about is the notion of the black box abstraction. A black box is um, a system, a program that is described only in terms of its inputs and its outputs. We don't care about what's underneath. What we care about is for the inputs and the outputs to be defined well enough such that we can form a useful mental model that allows us to operate it without breaking it. An example, of course, the function can be a block, black box and are used for black boxes, but a more complicated example would be an automobile, which has a steering wheel, a gas pedal, and a brake pedal. And you only need to operate those in order to get a, a car from A to B without caring whether it's a diesel engine under the hood or an electric car. And cars are complicated beasts. A web service is another black box, right? And uh, operating a web service is nothing like calling a function. Uh, it's more like um, operating an automobile. Um, and if you want to hear about this distinction between useful mental models and reality, uh, you, can, you should check out that uh, book I recommend over there, The Design of Everyday Things, which I recommend to every software developer. Now, the purpose of building black boxes is that you can uh, you know, connect multiple black boxes into bigger black boxes. And that is how we manage complexity. Uh, we create bigger and bigger black boxes that have um, clearly, hopefully clearly defined inputs and outputs. Uh, now, uh, no paradigm has like a sort of monopoly on composition, but FP developers surely like to talk about it. Um, and when they mean composition, they speak about this. Um, uh, if you've got two functions f and g, if the output of f matches the input of g, then you can combine them together easily, like automatically even. Um, now, of course, if the output of f is something more complicated, like an IO result, so we start talking about other protocols for composition, like applicative or monads and, you know, the good stuff. Uh, and this is basically um, what, um, um, people mean about composition, you define uh, clearly defined, you have clearly defined protocols for combining boxes together. Now, um, in terms of uh, which is better for what, OOP is best for describing black boxes. Um, and by the way, best doesn't mean that in an FP language like Haskell, you don't get facilities for describing black boxes. You do, and uh, a language like Haskell is good for describing black boxes, but we are talking about what's at hand and what's common in that language's culture. So uh, in OOP languages, people describe black, black boxes a lot because it's easy to do so. Uh, OOP is a great uh, paradigm for doing that. And static FP is best for composing uh, white boxes and black boxes alike, but there's a preference for white boxes. And by the way, in this talk, I'm talking about static FP. I'm not talking about FPS practice in dynamic languages, and there is a big def difference there. So what is OOP? And I'm asking this question because um, it's a confusing question, uh, and um, uh, I'm surprised that uh, if you ask 10 people, they might give 10 different answers. So, of course, it's about relationships between objects that send messages to each other, but uh, the defining properties of OOP, uh, and there's only one defining property of OOP that personally I care about is subtype polymorphism via single dynamic dispatch. Things get more complicated when we talk about multi-dispatch or row polymorphism, but uh, OOP for me is subtype polymorphism and encapsulation and inheritance kind of flows from that. Subtype polymorphism is um, 
basically the risk of substitution principle, meaning that in case you have a piece of logic that requires, for example, a set or super type, uh, um, you can um, take an object of a subtype and that subtype can perfectly substitute for the super type, uh, meaning that the sorted set will behave exactly like a set in, in uh, contexts where we, you require just a set. Um, in practical terms, this means hiding information at compile time. You don't care about uh, the sorted set being sorted. You just care about the properties of a set. Uh, this is idealization. So we remove the details we don't care about. Are object-oriented programming and FP orthogonal? Uh, well, yes, but we care that. Um, of course, when people ask this question, we think of immutable classes, but these are totally uninteresting because these are just record types. And by the way, if you um, inherit some traits for this customer here, um, you basically tell to the world that these getters and maybe setters are, these getters are meant for side effects. Um, there are really few instances in, in which you would need to inherit from traits in such samples from open traits, but I'm not talking about uh, sealed traits or anything like that. Those are algebraic data types. Um, but the interesting um, uh, classes are the ones that have state in them. So like iterator here, which basically uh, mutates a reference to an internal reference in order to iterate over a collection and it has this great quality that it works for every collection type in Scala or in Java. And we can certainly turn that into something pure by simply suspending side effects in I.O. making the calls to those methods to be referentially transparent. And now we are FP compatible, let's say. Now, Martin Nodersky loves saying that FP removes one important dimension of complexity. Uh, to understand the program part, you need no longer account for the possible executions that can lead to that program part, meaning that objects with identity, in order to reason about them, you have to know their history of interactions for to know, uh, to understand what will happen at the next uh, call, at the next method call, what's going to be the result of that. Um, and that is true, but he's basically speaking about idealized FP uh, because in practice, we also suspend defects in IO. Uh, it's, um, we still need to manage side effects. We still need to uh, mutate um, shared memory. We just delay that until the edge of the program, so to speak, but this difference for our purposes here, like do you depend on the history of evaluation or not in order to understand what that thing will return, will evaluate to, that's basically a technicality. Uh, and it's not even about the classes, you can have this in Haskell too, right? Except that now the internals are all exposed and you can man manipulate them without going through a well-defined protocol. Um, now that we've settled that, <laughs> let's talk about uh, type classes. Um, but first, we are going to talk about parametric polymorphism. Um, this identity function here is generic. It can take any type, uh, and it will return that type. And if you look closely at its definition, this function can have exactly one implementation because uh, we don't know anything about the A uh, type parameter here. Of course, on top of the JVM, we can do hash code equals and to string, but we are going to ignore that because we are, uh, you know, FP developers. So um, uh, parametric polymorphism in this case uh, gives us clarity into, into what the fu this function does. The more generic a function is, the less its implementation can do. For example, this full function here can do uh, a lot of things, like it can uh, concatenate the input with something else, it can reverse the string, it can return an empty string, and so on. It, can, it has multiple implementations here. Um, so um, take away this notion, uh, an abstract function, um, a generic function, the more generic it is, the less it can do now. 
um, let's describe a function that lists a uh, list of A's and that is generic that can work for integers and strings and that also works for empty lists. This would be like a classic problem. We could first um, try to define that um, with an OOP interface. Um, Assuming that we control the implementations of, and of string and int, of course, we could maybe send a PR to Oracle. But uh, would this work? Well, not really, because then uh, we would be able to add strings within. And I mean, what is this JavaScript? This is a fail and Liskov is sad. Not going to work out because ignoring details is not good in this case. We obviously can't add strings to uh, hints. And we can also use a, one Scala feature called the self type, which um, lets us work around that sort of, even though it complicates um, you know, the typing. But there's still on, uh, another problem remaining, which is that we need an empty a string or a zero for ints. We need to start from somewhere and that's not an instance method. That's a property of the class of the type itself. So, you know, these two fails. And uh, at this point, a well-grown um, Java developer would start defining dictionaries for the types, which are essentially type classes. Uh, we can define a combinable that has our sum operation, which we'll call combine, and then an empty um, function, which will give us like zero or the empty string. And that will allow us to sum up um, lists of any elements whatsoever. And uh, by the way, the shape of combinable kind of resembles the shape of uh, fold left, I mean, of its parameters. It's, well, fold left is a little more. Um, more flexible, but uh, that's not a coincidence. So uh, here we are passing this uh, dictionary uh, explicitly, which is what you do if you weren't in Scala. But in Scala, we can define that as an implicit instance, uh, as an implicit monoid uh, instance on integers, which knows how to sum up the numbers. And it's going to be visible globally. and this points to what type classes are. So uh, type classes are basically dictionaries of uh, methods and functions related to a type, not to a, a, an object instance, but to types, and that uh, are uh, globally, um, globally visible. So the language provides us with a facility for discovering these instances at compile time. So that's what implicits are. Um, and, um, um, you know, this allows us to um, um, use these monoids in our code. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use the mathematical name here because you can search it up on Google and then see its properties. Um, combinable doesn't tell me anything. Uh, so that combined operation is associative and the empty uh, element along combined with another element is going to be a no-op. It's not going to be have any effects, so to speak. So we can now define our sum in, in, uh, in terms of this monoid. And we Scala also provides us with some syntactic sugar here for adding a restriction to A. So type classes added uh, to a type parameter are called the restrictions. This sum is restricted now by monoids. And by looking at the signature, um, uh, the parametricity holds. So we can look at this signature and infer what it does. I mean, what can you do with a monoid uh, and you know, uh, applied on a list? Sum those numbers up, of course. So with parametric polymorphism, types dictate the implementation. It restricts the implementation. This intuition that the signature describes precisely what the implementation does is what static XP developers call parametricity. If you ever hear this violates parametricity in a PR, uh, that's like an OOP developer uh, saying uh, program to an interface, not to an implementation, you know, the ultimate screw you. So let's talk about the ideological clash between them because there is one. Um, this um, computer science is not evolved as a science, uh, it's not using the scientific method. 
so we are talking about ideologies because uh, human interaction is involved, um, social interactions, collaboration, and that's, uh, that stuff is hard to measure. So uh, whatever succeeds in the marketplace, that's based on how fit the products and the tools and the ideas are for you know, the current context we are in, which is an industry which is in hyper growth phase. So, um, um, you know, popularity uh, is an awful metric, but it's the best we've got, unfortunately. Um, and this, this is why these are ideologies because they have ideas about how it's best to do things and social movements behind them. So, um, we should talk about what OOP values and both want the same thing, except they approach it from different directions. Object-oriented design uh, values, flexibility of implementation, backwards compatibility, black boxes, resource management. Um, now, uh, in terms of resource management, FP got, it, uh, got some sleeves up, um, has, some, has some aces up its sleeve, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, um, but uh, OOP is best for resource management and resources also means memory management. I mean, have you ever taken a look at how a hash map implementation looks? Um, and um, um, OOP values backwards compatibility and flexibility of, of implementation, um, meaning that OOP interfaces promise uh, less than um, the consumers of those APIs may need. In, but that's uh, considered, let's say, um, sort of a, a good thing for the stability of the API because um, updating APIs for the purposes of correctness creates friction in collaboration between teams and so on. And FP values like the reverse of that, static FP. Uh, flexibility at the core site, correctness. I mean, if you ever find an API that's not correct because you've made a mistake, of course, you're going to break everybody's code. Uh, uh, dump data structures and dump data structures are reusable data structures. Uh, dealing with data, FP is great for dealing with data and composition. Uh, FP talks a lot about protocols for uh, composition. So you can view this as opposite sides, you know, kind of like left versus right or progressives versus conservatives. Uh, one values correctness, flexibility and flexibility of the core site. The other values API stability and, flex and flexibility of implementation. And of course, this is like um, a spectrum. Um, because, um, you know, I mean, it's useful to talk about the degenerate cases. The degenerate case for OOP would be an actor that is untyped. And uh, the degenerate case for FP would be the identity function. Actors are degenerate because it can literally do anything. Uh, that actor here could literally send shuttles to the moon, for all I know. This is basically word of mouth typing. Whereas identity does literally nothing being useful only in, for type Tetris and in presentations for proving a point. So I named these degenerate cases thinking about the degenerate era of the universe where like stars are dying, turned into white dwarfs and brown dwarfs uh, in their march to be eaten by black holes because that's how I feel when I work with untyped actors or when playing a lot of type Tetris. So, Am I going too fast? Type class superpowers. We can extend types we don't control. Um, and this is uh, really important because we can, for example, define an ordering uh, instance uh, for uh, our own types or for types in third party libraries. Ordering being the type class provided by the standard library, which is super useful. But we can also do automatic instance derivation if we have an ordering for an, uh, for an A defined or an ordering for an A1 and an A2 defined, we can define an ordering for the top automatically derived or we can automatically derive but not ordering for a list. And this is great. And this basically works like mathematical proofs. Static FP is a lot about mathematics. Um, so 
here we can say uh, implicit order for a tuple. If, in case we have ordering A and ordering B, we can define an ordering for uh, the tuple of A and B. Uh, in case we have an ordering for an A, we can define an ordering for a list of A. Now the implementation is not really important here. I basically, I might find a more elegant implementation, but I did this half an hour before the presentation. And you can derive pretty much anything, including case classes, but for case classes, you have to use shapeless or maybe, what was that other library name, Magnolia? Uh, but those are, you know, based on macros. So if you want to have some fun in crash or compiler, you should try one of those libraries out. Uh, in general, I, I stay away from deriving uh, instances for case classes, but if you want to do that, there are possibilities like, I don't know, if you want to like write another JSON library. So converting between styles. We are going to start with a nice uh, clean OB interface for JSON serialization. Of course, not even Java developers do this. Java developers do things at runtime. So uh, uh, in order to turn an OB style interface into a type class, you basically uh, add a type parameter and every function that used to operate on the, um, on the object instance now needs to take an explicit parameter. And this would be like a good uh, type class definition, a nice and simple one that's actually very usable in practice. Uh, and JSON serialization is a great use case for type classes. Now, of course, the more interesting examples are the OOP classes that have state. <clears throat> and here we have to uh, apply some functional programming um, because the state needs to be exposed. And here I'm using an abstract type member to expose a cursor in this iterator that will basically be mutated along the way. But here we are using a pure definition of next. Uh, so we are returning the next element and the next state. This will be, if you search on Google, uh, the state monad, uh, but uh, I mean, the shape of, of this signature, what's important here is that we are working with immutable data structures and we may not want that for performance reasons. Sometimes, I mean, this goes back to what Martin Nordelsky um, is used to saying that we can evaluate um, a function without knowing its history, but sometimes for performance, it's better to like do side effects and maybe suspend those in IO. So another, an alternative definition would be one that uses IO for the side effects. In this case, cursor can be something side effecting. So for a list, we, we could use uh, like, actually we could shove the real iterator here, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. So, and uh, this definition would be perfectly equivalent to this OP class that, uh, you know, suspends side effects in IO, but uh, you can see the difference here in the case of OP classes, the state is implicit, it's being held by this. And for type classes, the state is explicit being taken as a parameter. So everything becomes a parameter, type classes expose functions. Uh, one, uh, some things to keep in mind. So sometimes type classes expose its internals wide open and you may not want that. And also type classes introduce the need to have hierarchy types. As soon as you have type classes in the language, you also uh, start uh, needing uh, to talk about uh, types that have type parameters. That's what a hierarchy type is, uh, is for. So, um, and you know, this kind of introduces, you know, the need for extra expressivity, extra, uh, you, know, you know, features in the language. Haskell is a more expressive language than Scala, for example. And in Haskell, it's better to talk about higher printed types than in Scala. So in Scala, we need good taste for uh, when to use uh, type classes and higher printed types. Ah. Uh, Let's go in the other direction, converting type classes into OOP. With our favorite type class, the monad, and we are going to split this one in two operations because of course the monad cannot be converted because we have got a data constructor in pure and we've already seen that in what the monoid instance. So um, OOP classes cannot express uh, data constructors or uh, anything that uh, doesn't, uh, you know, depend on that object instance. 
So uh, we may be able to turn the flat map, but this one is difficult too, uh, as we've seen with the monoid combined. Uh, this would be like a first attempt from an OP developer. So, you know, uh, we've got a function that takes a function, it on a flat map and it returns flat map, but uh, we can't compose monadic types like this. Things would have been much simpler if we could, but we can't. So this is another uh, fail of the list of substitution principle. We don't need that here. Uh, we actually care about the types. So we can use another facility um, provided by Scala and not by other OP languages. We can uh, specify a self type here with a recursive uh, type parameter here to uh, let the compiler know what it is. And this is called uh, F bounded polymorphism. And <clears throat> It's absolutely awful. So um, it, it's not useful for actual polymorphism. It's only usefulness is in sharing the implementation details and the Scala collection libraries are doing that. So don't do this in practice, it's absolutely awful. Um, in case you need to express flat map, express it as a type class, right? Um, type class is to OP, not always possible. And, <clears throat> Um, this is why in OP we talk about design patterns. A design pattern is usually a name for an abstraction that your programming language doesn't let you turn into a library. Yeah, um, in case you can't express something as a type or, or as a function or of sorts, that's a design pattern. And it's okay uh, to talk about design patterns in object-oriented programming, uh, but you know, uh, things are less formalized. Recipes and best practices. I hope I have enough time, which is why I made an agenda because I may not uh, uh, use my time wisely. Uh, and these aren't uh, all the things I want to talk about, but uh, at least I will be able to name them. So uh, use type classes for data serialization. They are great for that. Whenever you have a data serialization need, uh, just go with type classes and uh, like JSON serialization, although there are some caveats there because you may want a different JSON serialization uh, for depending on the use case. Um, but uh, you know, we can simply ignore the coherency rule or define the new type there. Use type classes for expressing data constructor, data constructors. We've already seen monad and monoid, things that create objects, not use them. Uh, use type classes for usability of dumb data structures. Um, Type class instances must be coherent, globally unique. Um, this is a best practice that cannot be enforced by the compiler. Um, of course, we can we can uh, ignore that when we need, but it's best if we keep it as a best practice. Avoid orphaned type class instances, but do what you must. Type classes must not keep state. Use OP for managing resources information hiding. And this one is going to be painful. Use principle of least powers default to object-oriented programming. Sorry. Use type classes for data serialization. This is like a quick example from our own code. We defined a, a type class that handles logging. And this is because we want our logging to not log sensitive data. So for example, we don't have an instance defined for strings or ints or big decimals because we might log sensitive stuff. And we also have like a safe logger uh, abstraction in our code base that uh, uses this type class. And um, it's uh, this log message is like a data structure that resembles YAML. I mean, it can express strings, maps, lists, uh, uh, you know, and it, it can build like a nice output whenever we log via log back. So in our own code base, uh, we log via this safe interface, but uh, well, we also have like other libraries. This is a leaky abstraction because other libraries will log with whatever they want. But in our own code base, everything is safe and nice. And uh, this would be a great use case. Uh, and also JSON serialization um, libraries like uh, Churche um, use uh, type classes. Um, and it has, of course, caveats. It has the issues, but at least it's not Jackson. Uh, use type classes for expressing data constructors, which we've already mentioned. Um, quick, quick exercise. Let's do a, a function, let's pretend that traverse doesn't exist and do a function like sequence that can transform a list of IOs into IO of lists. 
we can't do that with an OOP with just an iterable because we need a data constructor. We need to build a data structure, not just iterate over it. Um, and in order to do that, we might come up with our own type class that's nice and uh, efficient, that specifies a buffer that will collect elements. So for list, that's going to be the list buffer. For arrays, that's going to be the array buffer. We also specify a way to iterate over it, and we are going to release some OOP stuff here. Uh, a way to build the buffer, a way to append to the buffer, and a way to convert that buffer into our final collection. And that's all we need. And by the way, this type class is close to the build from, from Scala standard library, which they use in the standard collections for you know transforming collections. Uh, we can quickly define uh, an instance for a list. So as I said, the buffer for our list is going to be the list buffer. These are, by the way, intermediate values. Abstract type members are good for specifying intermediate values that you don't care about after you're done. Um, sequence then becomes like a type Tetris with that uh, type class. You basically iterate over it with a forward left, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> the implementation doesn't matter. All that matters is the signature of sequence. And if you see that this is a collection builder, which means that you can build a collection and, then, and iterate over the world one, and then you see the signature here, uh, it pretty much is pretty much clear what it does. So again, parametricity for the win. Use type classes for usability of dumb data structures. This is a trait that Haskell developers love to brag about. Uh, here we have an example of a binary tree that's not necessarily a binary search tree. Uh, it's an awful example, by the way. And we can define uh, functions that pretend that the binary tree is a, a binary search uh, tree. So we can say it's a sorted set. And then we can have an inefficient set that doesn't take an ordering restriction and like treats that binary as a sort of very inefficient array or something. So uh, we can have like this too. So we can clearly see the reusability here. Um, it's an awful example, but it's the best one I could come up with uh, for this presentation. And here we get to uh, one uh, common issue with type class design in common use in Scala. Type class instances must be coherent, to, uh, which means globally unique. Because if we have the sorted set initialized from earlier, and by mistake, we import another ordering uh, instance in our scope, because we are importing with wildcard, uh, we can break our sorted set. It's, this is an issue of correctness. <clears throat> if, um, if type class instances aren't globally unique, uh, we need to be really careful uh, where we uh, import those uh, quote unquote uh, orphaned instances. <clears throat> like here, maybe we know what we are doing, but we need to be really careful about these uh, imports. Um, so it's fine if we have uh, exceptions, but remember that if um, type class instances are not globally unique, this is a correctness issue. Now, there's a caveat. Dumb data structures can be misleading. Some of them are not that dumb because sometimes invariant events set by the use functions are too important. And again, this sort of set uh, in the Haskell community is sort of like uh, a bad example for dumb data structures because this can happen. I mean, <clears throat> in case you build the sorted set and then try to use the functions on the inefficient set, that's just inefficient. But uh, the other way around, it's a malfunction because um, the sort of set is going to search via as if that binary tree is a binary search tree. And of course, it's not a binary search tree. tree. This is a type safety issue. So the easier thing, the easiest thing to do is to add that restriction on the data structure itself. So now we say A must implement ordering. And when you see that, because <clears throat> parametricity, we can figure out that this is a binary search tree. I mean, what else are you going to use this ordering for? Um, and this is actually saner and it's what Scala standard library does. And it's why uh, maybe in Scala, we don't need global uniqueness that much, even if we have to keep it as a best practice. Now type classes must not keep state. And this is a super important one. If it keeps state, uh, if a type class instance 
here state it's not a type class. So I'm going to give an example. Uh, this would be like a, an interface for a registration, the registration of users. So it's going to save in the database and it's going to send an email, let's say. Uh, it's not a type class. And you can see it from the signature. Uh, you can see that uh, in order to save to a database and in order to send an email, you need a JDBC database connection and you need an, an SMTP uh, email connection for sending emails. And you don't have these as parameters, so they need to come from somewhere, so it's shared state. Uh, and of course, everything is uh, fine if we do this, I actually lot like this, <clears throat> but uh, this is not a type class. This will have a constructor somewhere like taking the user DB in the email service uh, in, uh, and then building a real registration service out of that. This is all be driven design. To turn that into a type class, we have to add the environment. The environment meaning the JDBC connection along with the SMTP connection for sending emails. That needs to be visible in the signature. So we could add another type parameter here like um, a nymph, uh, which is going to be a parameter of register user. And it's going, everything is going to be explicit. So I, I basically did a half-based, half-baked cake here in order to specify these dependencies here as the environment. And this instance here, uh, you can clearly see it that it's going to be a user DB and an email service. And you can see again, parametricity from the type that it's going to save a user and send an email. Um, well, there's always the question of, do you really need that? Um, and then you can define like a fake registration service that instead of the environment, you have a unit or something fake like that, that doesn't do anything. And then you can see from the signature that it's a fake registration service. That's, uh, you know, <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Another problem, I feel like, like I'm going too fast here, sorry. Another problem is that we used two type parameters here and, you know, Type parameters in Scala. <clears throat> um, too many type parameters are not good for our health. And um, we can try to simplify that with a single type parameter by making it more complicated. And um, in order to do that, F, by the way, F in these samples can be IO. So it's basically like the type that is going to suspend our side effects. So that's why we need to we need the environment and we need F. That can be IO or could be ID for the fake implementation. Uh, but um, here uh, we get rid of F. I mean, we could put IO everywhere, but then IO can launch missiles to the moon. So we still want to work with F. So we put F, the type parameter, on the function itself. And then F is uh, the environment is going to be parameter parametrized. I'm butchering the English language. language. By F. So, um, one interesting um, difference here is that we need this monad restriction here, and this is um, we we really need it in order to combine the sending of an email with the saving in a database. And this adds a restriction on the possible implementations. For example, we couldn't do those thing, things in parallel. For that, we need to add in the interface another type class like parallel. So it's going to show up here in, instead of showing up here in the instance implementation. And that can be okay, but uh, you know, not really. I mean, sometimes it's best to just stick with hobby driven design for managing resources and information hiding. I don't need to know that uh, personally. I don't need to know that a registration service uses a database and the test SMTP connection under the hood. Um, I mean, take a look at this signature, which uh, is like the OOP driven design. For me, this is much simpler, even if some correctness is sacrificed. And let's also talk about what I said in the beginning. Uh, OOP hides uh, implementation, preferring flexibility of implementation. Uh, here we are not exposing an error type. Should we have exposed a JDBC exception? Maybe, I mean, that would have given more flexibility at the call side. The consumer would know better what to do, but 
the JDBC exception is an implementation detail and it's, it leaks implementation. And what happens when the implementer is going to uh, change the implementation of this to use a Redis connection or something else. So that's what I meant by flexibility of implementation, the flexibility to change the engine under the hood without the user noticing via the type system. And of course, it can be said that uh, not exposing the error type is an undescribed uh, error condition, but sometimes that's okay in case um, we are talking about this distinction between input errors and uh, um, faults. And here Liskov is happy, right? So here is one of those cases in which I think the Liskov substitution principle perfectly applies. So one last final um, advice, use principle of least powers. You have a complexity budget, all abstraction has a cost in use tooling, learning curve comprehension. And don't use a type class if an OOP class or a higher order function would do. Scala is not Haskell. I mean, it's not as expressive as Haskell. All type classes need to be defended. All type parameters need to be defended. All, all abstractions need to be defended in PRs, right? Uh, and beware of false abstractions, meaning that if you don't have two samples that you abstract over, that's not an abstraction. Anyway, so um, I, uh, we may be able to talk more about my fast-paced presentation here in uh, the Q&A session. So uh, anyway, I hope that was useful. <laughs> so, oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. That was a, that was a breathtaking talk. Um, you haven't seen what been ha what's been happening on the Joy Channel. <laughs> no, <laughs> tons of discussions. Uh, yep. Well, uh, but well, first of all, a round of applause. Thank you very much. A really breathtaking talk. Um, we don't have that much time. Actually, we're a bit over time. Uh, yeah. But well, uh, I mentioned a few things that happened on the Joy Channel. Um, well, for instance. Um, so Josiah mentioned that one of the things that I enjoy about statically typed FP over OOP is that the types of internal operations being exposed give me clear view of which behaviors I have to handle. And someone replied to that, that that sounds like an argument for checked exceptions. Well, I'm bringing that up because I know you have a, you've had an uh, opinion about that. So what would you comment? How would you comment? Um, I think there's a distinction between uh, input uh, errors and output errors, meaning uh, output errors that should reach the vendor of the software. And uh, in case of output errors, um, all you can do is log the error and retry maybe the operation later, and that's it. You can't uh, expect the user to do anything. You can't recover in a more sm in a smarter way, let's say. And uh, output errors is basically the distinction between HTTP error codes for 100 and 500, right? So for uh, HTTP 400 error codes, you can do something about it for HTTP 500, you can try again later, right? So, and that's it. And some errors are, are, um, are not worth it to be exposed in the type system and exposing uh, errors all the time in the type system actually leads to uh, programmers completely ignoring them, which is what happened in the Java ecosystem. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I witnessed that a long time yes. ago. Um, also, um, someone going by the nick of GD557, uh, that's an interesting one, said, uh, I think that all times, or almost every time that I try to use F-bounded polymorphism, I ended up giving up and refactoring the whole code. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's right, you should not do that. <laughs> yes. Okay, um, so I guess that's it. Once again, thank you very much.